So my question is, um, whether you can spare some time at this point, but I want to move to uh, Mr. Kamala in the field of human capital and how this is also an item of human capital. Four semesters into technology and MSNs, here we put it. I read a report from one of my colleagues. It said it was in 2017, and it said that this year, why? Those who are going to work and those who are not going to work should we be afraid as entrepreneurs? What should we do? Those of us who are still in school, what should we be looking out for? Should we always be in lecture halls or we should try to get paid? And if yes, how should we go from there? So, this question is to all of you. Or, you know, I feel that this is one side. I'll start from Thank you. I think as students, uh, we need to always look at what are the new trends in the industry. How do we position ourselves to be marked out in case um, people are looking out for these skills or this skill set? How do we position ourselves to be able to be uh, picked by this institution? That's why I was saying that you don't wait till you finish school before you start, you start building your skill set. You need to start building that skill set whilst you're in school, um, so that by the time you complete school, you already have some sort of experience um, to be able to get into the industry. Um, I work from a different perspective, because for me, I work mostly with non-skilled labor, where I have to train them, build their skills, and then employ them. So my own is more of a social enterprise sort of um, organization that I'm running. But as we move forward, you know, one thing about, I realized something in, uh, in other countries. For instance, when you go to Germany, as early as age 15, when students are going to university, people split. They have people who actually design that, they, I don't want to go into academia, I want to go into industry. So they move straight, they still go for lectures as students, and then they build their, but they are always in the factories and then the companies where they learn as apprentices. So they have the apprenticeship system where they learn and also go for um, academic lectures at some time. But by the time they are completely done with the, uh, with the five years or four years, they are very good at what they are doing. And that's why we have those countries be very efficient with what they do. We can do the same thing, unlike us, a lot of us who go, we, we, we go to school, 
all the time, we vacation, we just sleep over, um, we eat and sleep, and then come back to school, study, and um, but unfortunately, too, we don't also read white. So we, we hardly even get to know what is building up on the outside. So we get stuck after school. We don't know which direction we have to go. We don't know where to, to find ourselves. And then we say there's unemployment. But if we are positioning ourselves very well to check out, we will read white, get to know what is trending in the system. As a, at some point in Ghana, everybody was doing business. Because these are things people, let's get the skills. Now technology is out there, how are we building ourselves to embrace that? To make sure that if people want um, top notch people to handle their technology stuff, how can we be the one to take, or how can we build our own technology industry? To fit into the industries, to get them to work, and then build um, something for ourselves. So I think we need to start building that from whilst we're in school, and make sure that we can position ourselves for the takeoff. Other than that, we are not. I think we are too timid, we're too relaxed, we're too comfortable. Skill sets, if you ask me, we are way behind. Okay. You, and I, I don't know whether to attribute some of this to some aspect of our career guidance as we grow our careers. So people are here offering computer science, but they end up and they're in the food business and vice versa. So you finish GSS, you're a smart person, you go and do science. After science, you go and do medicine. You find that person in the doctor's office and he's now thinking stuff as to what is wrong with you. Virtually killing people indirectly, because whatever the internet says, it's based on research out there, not here. I offer it publishes the here and kill me tonight. Right now, I live my life as a full-time information security person. I still deliver on my publishing stuff though, but this is my passion. It's my gaming hobby back in the days in Tendo, and now I do IT full-time. So back to the skill set issue, and up to now, I still stay. Because technology is evolving every second. 2016, if those of you into web security, when you're accessing your website and you see this green bar, HTTPS, you know you're secure or your transport is encrypted. 2016, SSL 3.0 uh, version was the most secure. By January 2017, it was the weakest. TLS 1.1, TLS 1.2. As I speak with you, TLS 1.2. Back to those of us who code or build applications, etc. How do we even code with security in mind? It's not something that we are aware of. We're just looking at functionality. But beyond all this is security. So I'll just take the security aspect of this person. Question is, why do we keep our homes and leave our doors open? Why? When we are coming here, security, right? Why do you keep money in your pocket in a very sensitive area you are aware that my money is here or my phone is here? Security. It's the same thing in industry 4.0 and Everything is going to be much simpler, much more automated, but you need to keep that security in the industry. They're going to give you the options to choose. They're not going to decide for you. Because mind you, every vendor or every solution out there wants information from you to as upgrade one, upgrade two, upgrade three. So if you don't go and say, oh, I don't want to share my location services with you, they will take it. So go to like the timeline of Google.com, even when your GPS is off, Google knows everywhere you're going. And it's scary. Well, I am scared, maybe some people don't know. But I mean, beyond that, there are so many aspects to security with skill set that and it's very worrying. Look at the Western and Eastern counties, eight year old, twelve year old uh, programming, very sophisticated solutions. But today I don't cool, but now I've had to actually start learning Python. Because in the security space I find myself in scripting and information is key. So I need to now go back to my books and start learning Python. 
I think programming should be part of everybody's curriculum in one way or the other. It shouldn't just be the hard core, but anything that pertains to your career by way of development and making simple systems, you should actually have hands on uh, exposure on it. You can put your hands together for it. Okay, so just my answer would be very simple. The skilling is very key. We we Africans have gradually turned ourselves into consumers rather than producers. For the world to feel our presence in this fourth revolution. We cannot continue being consumers. We have to be producers. When I say producers, what do I mean? Most of these languages and these new technologies that we are talking about, it was actually being developed. Africa's contribution to the development of new things is minimal. I'm not saying we are not contributing. You go to certain areas like Kenya, South Africa, they are doing quite a lot. But the contribution to this global picture of what is happening, we are not. And I will start it from the very bottom. You will get the chance to choose, choose your subjects that you believe you can do well in at the end of DHS. Or I'm thinking maybe at the end of uh, end of SHS. Which means you spend quite a lot, a lot of your time doing general things. If we really want to be leaders in this new revolution, we will have to turn the tables around. And once we are investing, we're the best place to start. If your teacher is not teaching you what stops you from acquiring the knowledge, when you go online, there are so many things you can learn about the new things that are coming that will change what you are doing now. You will realize at some point that what I am actually studying might not take me anywhere. And trust me, online, there are a million things that can direct your interest. That's where your passion is. You can, only, you can also build your own competencies online. So that is the learning bit. When it comes to structures within our economy, is our government and our politicians or our leaders positioning the country or the youth in such a way that they open up tools and other things for us to be able to develop them and grow so we can partake in it? The fourth revolution has already started, and so people are running deep and wide on it. What are we doing to be able to get to that level? I'm thinking that for skill set, we need to start building it from the lower level. As a, a, a person who practically works on things on the ground, I feel so much of confidence to use very efficiently. When I get in graduate coming fresh, the first six months, you realize that the experience on the ground is totally different from what we actually acquire. So my thinking is, why don't you now start acquiring practical use of some of the things that you do? By the time you get into the real world, you have built up the Otherwise, the future will still be far away from us once people are actually partaking in the future that we see as we are. So, to add to that bit, sometimes, I don't know, when, when it comes to acquiring knowledge, it's not always about the financial investment. I mean, you buy credits like 100 cities a week, you go to SFS, you use the food with all that. Save some of the money and invest in some of these platforms. Because, mind you, when you get into the corporate and space, one thing you really wish for is data, connectivity. And I keep telling a lot of my interns, national service, when you work in a company that gives you data for free, trust me, and then you pay 200 and pay the data. Because what you will acquire sitting in your house with that internet connectivity is more than that 200 cities. Invest in that data, not for the social media stuff, but in yourself. And sometimes it takes just that bold step to approach some of us. As in, if any of you guys walk up to me and say, you know what, we want to learn security, we don't know where to start, start, take us up. Sometimes it's not about the money, some, sometimes it's just a passion that, wow, have somebody willing to learn. I can give back to society, I thought, what do I lose? I spent time. Those days in school in Africa Hall. I took a job second year in Africa Hall, the internet cafe. It wasn't for the money. 
as staff to get internet access for free. And that was my motivation. So name it. I would always be there after classes, after meetings. I would just go. It wasn't for the money. I just had free internet access. And I learned on the job. Before we got out into our various workspaces, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew networking, I knew how to set up stuff. So sometimes, approach some of these industry experts, it's not always about the money. Sometimes you just need that mentorship. But of course, you need to stay disciplined. Okay. So yearn for knowledge, ask, 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 ask. One thing I also like to say, let us also look at where the opportunities are and then tap into them. Um, I did psychology in my third degree. I remember the first time I was at a program, as I was at an event, and somebody was like, which engineering school did you go? And I'm like, I've never been studied engineering, but I'm building bicycles. And so it's, it's, we need to look at, so when I was in my third year, I said that I, I need to start doing something so that when I'm out of school, I can start building up the knowledge. So I took, I will stay in school, OBA, vacation, to do internships with companies, just to learn about how to run a business. How do I make sure I can run my business effectively if I'm on my own? And that really did help me. And so we need to start looking at where the opportunities are and then prepare ourselves for them when we are out there to face the world. Okay, just let me know the last thing. So, I'm, if I need to be really, really brutal, your degree will be worthless after five years. I studied computer science, I finished 2001. That's way back. I am thinking that it is useless now. The kind of things I'm doing is totally different from what I studied. If you think your degree is what's going to drive everything for you now, you need to rethink. As I sit here right now, I have signed on for a new degree that I'm starting on the 27th of July. Because I see myself as somebody for the future, I can only be part of the future if I'm ready for it. How can you be ready for it if you don't have the knowledge? And I think that is what Africa is um, um, lacking. We think when we get the base foundation and foundational education, it is all that we need. And we run out writing our CVs with our CDL degrees of 20 years ago. I am telling you, every five years, or if you are a strategic person, at least every half year, learn something major, new in your life. There are courses online that are for free, Coursera, so many other platforms that you can go and learn stuff. Learn something new every half year or every quarter, and you will be ready for the future. So that's, that's for another discussion. Um, I also want to be brutal. Yeah, for you. Okay. So students are here. It's very expensive. The last time I told a friend, it's very expensive to apply for a or card if you want. That to, it's very expensive to apply data, you know, instead of banking, and to apply a bank or card. You could tell someone, can I use your card to run an errand? The person will just throw your cash out. Right. I've used your hotspot, <laughs> and everybody is like, serious. So my question is, since this is good, why is data so expensive in Ghana? Why is data so expensive in Ghana? So if we pair that against our eagerness to innovate, we wouldn't get like, a very good, you know, line. It will, it, it, will, it will decline. Because data is so expensive, you need to learn, you need to sign up on these, you know, course. Sometimes, for example, at the class system, there is no free Wi-Fi. So the last time I told them, how dare you provide us with washrooms and you don't give us free Wi-Fi? Because there are people who don't mind not eating, but staying online. And they are, okay, why is data so expensive? And how are you willing to support entrepreneurs, students, with the new age of, you know, data sharing for us to be more productive? You can decide to answer all that. <laughs> so, shall we start from that side? <laughs> okay, so just, you, you are now changing the goalpost. We were talking about Maslow 
and the hierarchy and how technology plays in it. But as a man, you are under me, but I'll take you on the channel. Look, everybody complains that data is expensive. There are so many elements that as a temple, we need to put together to provide the service. There are so many moving parts, network elements that we need to actually put together to make sure that we give you the connectivity that we need, connectivity that you require to be part of this digital age. So many initiatives we are putting in place. For example, we are now embarking on providing affordable Wi-Fi to universities, and I think here in the USD, we started with here in the already. We're doing that with other, um, uh, how do you call it, institutions. We price our connectivity for educational institutions totally different. You let me move to the next slide now. For if I am selling one gig of data or one meg of data to Talo, the pricing is different. I will be losing when I sell to education, but I know education has an input in the future economy of Ghana. In that instance, I am prepared to run at par when I sell to um, um, how do you call it, educational institutions and then make my profits, average profits with the corporates that I work with as well. So we are making an effort. When we started um, this journey of bringing um, data digitization to people way back, the cost of internet was far more expensive than this. At the moment, I think we are running quite lower than we used to be when we started doing data networking systems in Ghana. So I know we will get there. But as we talk about data, when anybody gives you something that is totally free, you need to be worried. Because Ghana is a country, Africa is a place where maintenance is not our kind of thing that we do. If I begin to give free to everybody, in the next eight months, I will not be able to give to you again. Because I will not have the returns to maintain the network and bring you the new technology that you require to be part of the future. So we are definitely going to have this discussion some days to come. But gradually we are getting there. Surprisingly, on campuses, this is the beginning of the future. Wi-Fi is now abundantly available. We want to make sure that we do that to all tertiary institutions just to support the growth of the organization. Because now I think we realize that connectivity is a human right. So we give it to people that require to have that right. So next time you meet any of these uh, policy makers when it comes to the telecom space, I think they should be the first to answer. Vodafone would answer accordingly. Having also been in the telecom space, I mean, policy level, we don't have the government taking charge of the major infrastructure needed to be done. So you have the very footprint that's going to drive the internet to this country, owned by third parties. Foreigners who don't have policy regulating it to our interest, but their interest. So it's definitely not going to work for us. So Vodafone is in business, I mean, it's not a charity organization. They will do their bit by law CSR, but the honest rest lies on really these policy makers and the kind of infrastructure we want. Currently, most of the fiber infrastructure, the very resilient ones, are not owned by us. They're owned by your people, your Google people. You know? So I wasn't taking a hit from you. So some of these things need to be addressed at the top level, and then it trickles down. Not to talk about currency, etc., etc. But internally, we need to address some of these things. After you don't have people going to have such infrastructure and making profits for, for themselves. So it's defined. You can only come and run this infrastructure at this price, at this rate. If you are willing to come, if you are not, go away. But we are not bold enough to make such decisions. And then the trickle down, the ripple effect comes back to affect us. So we have students rather than buying an address and all that. You know. But yes, I, I am for you guys, okay? Um, so I just want to know the way. Um, I've known Ghana as one country that doesn't really have any working policy on the internet. And I don't know if we really have 
a national policy on um, data management and, 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 and internet usage and stuff like that. Because I think in other countries, there's a conscious effort and a drive by the country to see that by 2020, by 20, so, by so, so and so years, this is where we want to get things to. And then you see the country is driving it forward. And now it takes like, even registering things in Rwanda takes like three days and you've registered it and you are done. Rwanda is just moving up there because of technology. And we sit here and always talk back and forth, talk about, do we even have a different policy on that? So that, that might be the problem. Let me, let me answer that. So back to technology, and please, let's, let's understand this fact very well. Ignorance of the law, they say, is no excuse. There are laws in Ghana that govern internet usage, electronic usage, etc. Don't be fooled. If you don't flout any of them, you may think it doesn't work. There is the Electronic Transactions Act, Electronic Communications Act, there's a Data Protection Act, there's a Cyber Security Framework yet to be passed into law. Make the time and understand some of these terms and conditions because if you flout any, just like in terms of hacking, we have something called script keepers, where you're new to hacking and you try, you see something online, you try running it on your machine to see whether it works or not. And then before you realize, you brought down the whole network of the school, etc. Et the law will not say you're a minor or you didn't know what you're doing, you go to jail. Please. So let's be well informed on some of these things before we get to the wrong side of the law. There are some of these acts, but the law as it is, if you flout it, you never know it's actually what it is. Thank you. Alright, so um, at this time, um, I think we need to give a round of applause to our panelists. We want to, I'm going to take your questions. I'm going to take five questions. Five questions. And please, three questions. Straight to if you're not sure, go back and learn. You know, preserve your questions at the 2019. We'll take you. three questions. Three. Three questions. All right. Please come around. So you mention your name and your school. Or the team you registered when you asked your question. Yeah. You just want to So this team? Um, Aaron from NEST. Uh, so I have a question for you. Um, so with 5G, there are a couple of countries that are testing that um, right now. And if you look at our country, just a few networks are on the 4G spectrum. And most of them are on 3G, maybe a bit of them. So I want to know at this current time that we're in, why is it not so greedy? Thank you very much, Best. Um, so, Vodafone has been pioneer, not in Ghana, but also in the global context. We've been testing 5G for a while. I think we've implemented 5G in about four or five of our outposts already. We set up the first lab to do some of the testing for 5G. So, we really do understand where um, data consumption is and where we need to also position our network. Our network currently, we provide 3.75 G um, that we have. The speeds are quite comparable to 4G. I'm not saying it is 4G. We do have plans in place of working and making sure that we bring in 4G because our customers are requesting it and we believe that the data requirements that we have currently, 4G will serve us better. And our plan to be the key leader of IoT in Africa, 4G network is one of the key uh, models that we need to be able to use to deliver. Yes, NB IoT is there, but we think of a little more connected devices on uh, 4G. We have it in plans and very soon we'll hear from us our network of 4G that we need to provide to our users. Um, round of applause. So we want a third person. Okay. Okay. okay, my name is Terrence from Nest. And we are... Okay, so Nest is not from Nest. So we are all talking about AI and machine learning. But all these things depend on data. You need to train them. I'm not talking about bandwidth, 
So when I take somebody's data for providing them with telecommunication services, that's exactly what I need to do the data for. I can study the data and tell you that you need more data in the weekend, but it's for you. So that is good for you. I cannot allow a third party to have access to my data. That is where we are talking about Cambridge Analytica at the moment, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, and where Mark, uh, Mark finds himself in deep waters at the moment. So what we are trying to do at Vodafone is that we are now building test environments for people like you to come in and test your Vodafone. In our IoT platform that we have, we are actually working together. When we launched it, we actually launched a session with developers where we said we'll be able to open up our network for people to come in and do trials of what we think will be the future. We are doing that, but as we give access to your data, we need to now bring players which is in the area and the government and different protection we have to do it before we can have access to that. If I did use your data for something else and you found out, I would be in trouble. So there's so much that we need to do to get to that level. But trust me, we have test data, test environment that if we are willing and ready to work with us, if we see our innovation and transformation director as manager here, she'll be able to help us help you through the process to be able to work with us. But now the future, we're not going to the future. to 
get to meet their needs and because we've had instances, I've had a lady friend whose internship letter was thrown back at her. And so sometimes, let's say like it gets to be who you know or who you to be. So what does it really take and where should you go and all those things? Can you address that? Thank you. Uh, that question, which is answered during our networking session, we will walk to them you know, to get personal and ask you know, those questions. And I'll also uh, ask you to provide your social media handles for people to stalk and follow you. All right, gentlemen, last question. Hello, my name is Tito, I'm here once again, and I'm from Kenya. I have two questions. The first is going to Benefit business for you more of a young part to create this advice for the future. Is Benefit business ready more of a young part to create this advice for the future? Also, um, we were talking about learning a lot from the interns, and I have this question. In the business of doing any marketing information with interns, how do you filter out the big interns or our friends? That's great news. I don't know if drive content or feeds to their site on such big hits. So let's say I want people to click on the link to come to my site. I'm going to put up yesterday's news about the president demystifying everything about the military database. And everybody will be curious, what did he finally say about it? That's to drive stuff into my site. But you realize the banner information is actually fake. They will just put people out there. Mind you, some of these links also, when it comes to security, we have something we call phishing, tagging, etc. When you click on these links, they only lead you to the actual resource. So I have a friend who has a link. He will look for the most useless information tag out there. Let's say easy food hits one billion customers. And you, you, you'll be the first person to want to click that link, right? But guess what? The minute you click that link, everything on your computer. So you click on that link, your screen goes blank for five seconds. It comes back. Oh, okay, the monitor is messing up or something. No. Within that five seconds, I run a script that gives me access to your computer forever and ever. The minute you get online, I have access to your computer. You will never know. So be careful of some of these links you click on. Whether it's actual news or fake news. If you're not sure, don't click. The second part is filtering out good uh, security, sorry, knowledge, learning sites, etc. It goes with reputation. If you have a site like, uh, let me see, quickrupony.com, tutorials on bicycles, something, you know definitely his name is not quickrupony.tutorial.com. He has a name. So definitely, right away, you know that that content is not actually linked from him. Take, for instance, the likes of Udemy, Coursera, Allison. They have the reputation up there. You can actually write an email, check on their integrity, offices, etc. But if you come to the somewhat deep or dark web, where you have a lot of fake stuff, because that's the terrain down there, those, whatever you see is not what you get. <laughs> you understand me, right? So sometimes you just need to check the integrity of these people, who they say they are, where they have been, what kind of content they are offering, where their reputation leads to. So you have the likes of the Ivy League schools even being very skeptical about who they associate with. So if I go to the likes of Allison or edX, for instance, and I realize there's Harvard, there's Yale, etc. Well, so we are really keen on development. So if we found out that there are skilled people to work with to develop, we are just supportive. We will give you the tools that we require to be able to do that. And we're supportive of second chances. And I'm saying more that we have done We've done stuff for women and uh, young ladies, app development, STEM, yes, we work with STEM. So we're really keen on working with development and startups. And, uh, and women. My boss says, and, and women. Women are key uh, and uh, people for us, yes. Oh. So just to touch on the women, for the ladies out here, please, this is your time. I've had quite a number of job adverts where they give priority to women. 
in the security space. So please, if you are a lady you want to be in the tech space, this is your time. Make sure you grab her contract and everything and really stock her very well, okay? Because now we are trying to balance the whole male-female thing in the tech space. And a lot of opportunities are being given to the lady. So please, take advantage of that. Then, in addition to the training, so we, we can also come back home, not just go online, online. If you don't have data, we have very reputable training centers here in Ghana. Very good example is certified Ghana. Okay, I train over there so I can vouch for them. When we're in school, we always have this thing of writing our CVs and, oh, I'm good in Word and Excel and PowerPoint. I mean, come on, who reads that? How do I know whether you're good in Word, Excel, or PowerPoint? And guess what? We all crack office onto our laptops. We install the crack version, right? Who opens Outlook? How many of us open Outlook in the whole four years? Microsoft Outlook. But the first day you get to work, that's what is going to be open to you. This is your email outlook. Then you find yourself fumbling. Now we say to you, even composing a simple email, corporate clean email, it's an issue. So please take advantage of some of these local vendors you have here, certified Ghana. At least you can present a certificate in Word, Excel, PowerPoint as a Microsoft Office specialist in Word, Excel, PowerPoint. So you don't put on your CV, I'm, I am good in Word and Excel, I am what, computer literate, I mean, how do I determine that? Take some of these courses, go through the mill. And Excel for one, we really downplay it in school. People even find the Excel user interface as funny, trust me. In this day and age of data and analytics, that is your starting point. Okay, before you even get to the complex of SQLs and Watson Analytics, etc. Just Excel. So let's take advantage of certified grammar. Let's take some of these courses. Let's not finish school and find out.